In our previous video, we talked about the change management process. But of course, eventually, the actual change will need to be implemented into your environment. And that usually relies on the technical staff to be able to make these changes. When you're making changes to one or two devices at home, it's a relatively straightforward process. But when you're working in an environment with tens, hundreds, or even thousands of devices, what would be a very simple update for a single device can turn into a very complex process. So in this video, let's talk about the change control process from the perspective of the technician. The change control process itself is one that is concerned with what needs to change. But of course, the technician is the one who will be actually performing these changes. For example, a technician may be asked to make a change to an allow list or a deny list. These are lists that are commonly used to allow or prevent certain applications from working in your environment. This is because certain applications can be considered dangerous. These applications might have known vulnerabilities, or perhaps they're well-known applications for carrying malware and infecting other systems. It would make sense then for a technician to add those malicious applications to a deny list or perhaps include only the applications that they'd like to run to an allow list. If you're managing an allow list, this means that only the applications you've named will be able to run on people's workstations. Everything is restricted except the things that you add to the allow list. A deny list is a little bit more flexible in that you could run any application you'd like except for the applications that have been specifically named on the deny list. For example, it's common to think of antivirus and anti-malware as being a very large deny list. Everything can run on your system except specific types of code that are identified by the anti-malware. When a change is submitted to a change control board, there's a very specific documented scope for making this change. And as part of this change control, you're limited to only making changes to what is specifically listed in the change control document. For example, a change control board may schedule a two-hour window for you to be able to upgrade a series of printer drivers. But that doesn't mean during that same two-hour period that you can make other changes to other applications just because the window happens to be available. However, this doesn't mean that you're limited to only what is listed in the change control documents. There may be times where you have to make additional updates or expand the scope to be able to complete the primary goal of that particular change. For example, you may find that the process of upgrading those printer drivers requires a modification to a configuration file on everyone's system. And although that wasn't specifically written as part of the scope of this change, this change can only take place if you make that modification. And if this is a relatively simple modification, there may be policies in place that allow you to make the decision to modify that file so that you can complete the overall change control process. This is why it's important to have a well-documented change control process so that everyone understands the procedures that should occur if you need to change the scope of the change control. When most people hear the term change control, they automatically think about downtime. And although this doesn't necessarily mean that there will be downtime during the change, we very often set aside a certain range to tell people that there might be some unavailability during this particular window. This is one of the reasons, as an IT professional, we tend to make these changes during non-production hours. So the overnight hours or times when people are not working on a particular application would be a perfect time to make any type of significant change to the application. If you work for an organization that is up and running 24 by 7, then you may find it very difficult to find a change control window where downtime is tolerated. In those environments, it's probably more common to have a system where you could switch to a secondary system, update the primary system, and then switch over seamlessly to prevent any type of downtime. This move between a primary and secondary system is probably one that's relatively automated so that it can make that change as quickly as possible. This also allows you to monitor the change. And if you notice that there are problems, you can switch back to the secondary system, which at this point you haven't made any changes to. This makes it very easy to fall back to a previous configuration by simply pointing all of your users to either the primary or the secondary system. 
And of course, if there could be downtime, you need to be sure that everyone is aware of any potential outages that may occur during that window. It's common to send out emails informing everyone of this particular downtime, or you could have a centralized change control calendar where people can proactively view what may be happening at any particular time of the day. If you've been part of implementing one of these change controls, one of the things that you probably had to do just before bringing everything back online is to reboot the system. This may be required by the change. You may have a new configuration that will only be implemented if you restart the system. This may require rebooting the operating system itself. Or if you're in front of the physical device, you may be able to physically power it down and power it back on again. Or this may only require you stopping and restarting a service that's running in that operating system. This also helps you understand if this system is going to be able to recover properly if there happens to be a power outage. But if you're rebooting the system as part of your change control, you'll know exactly how that system will react if it happens to need a power cycle. If the documentation says that we only need to stop and restart a service, this can usually be done relatively quickly. We can do this from the Windows services, from Task Manager inside of Windows, or if it's Linux, we may be able to restart a daemon that's already running in the background. And if we're updating an executable that's on a system, we may require our users to log out of that application, completely close down and exit the app, and then restart it with the updated application. One challenging aspect of this change control process is when you're making a change that could affect a legacy application. Legacy applications have usually been running for a very long time, and there are no current plans to change out this particular app. To add additional complexity, it's very common for these legacy applications to no longer be supported by the developer, assuming, of course, that the developer is even still in business. These are usually the systems with a sign that says don't make any changes to this system because no one in the organization understands the application or how to support any aspect of this system. However, you may find that this application is not as complex as you may have first thought. And by documenting the application and how it's installed onto the system, you can bring it into the normal support cycle for your organization. This doesn't necessarily mean that the support for this app becomes seamless, because there may be some idiosyncrasies that are specific to this older application running on an older operating system. You'll find that after documenting these systems and understanding how they work just a little bit better, you'll become the expert in this system. And everyone in your organization will be able to now support that system a little bit better. If you've ever had to manage a large-scale operating system that is providing services for hundreds or thousands of people, then you know that making a simple upgrade can sometimes be complicated because of dependencies. With dependencies, you have to first make a change to one application or service before you're able to install or update another application or service. Or it may be that the service that you've installed won't work until a secondary service is also installed on that system. This certainly complicates the change control process. We thought we were updating and changing one application. And now we have to update a number of different services just to provide the original update. And in some cases, the dependencies may not even be on the same system. For example, to be able to install a new version of your firewall management software, it may also require your firewalls to be running at a new version of code. So you would first have to update all of your firewalls and then you would need to update the firewall management software. With change control, it's certainly true that the only constant is change. You might have change control processes occurring in your data center every week or perhaps even every day. And every change has something that has now been modified to what it was before. This means that any documentation you have of your environment could very quickly be out of date without some type of ongoing documentation process. That's why we commonly see documentation being required with the change management process itself so that you are always creating the most updated set of documentation for your network. This might include updating diagrams or charts that have a network configuration. You might have to modify IP addresses or different configurations. Or you may have to list a new series of processes or procedures for managing a brand new application that has been upgraded in your production network. And if you're dealing with change control, then you're probably also dealing with different versions of code, software, or configurations that need to be applied to these systems. 
in these situations, it's very useful to have some way to keep track of all of these different versions that have been installed. And this also might give you a way to revert to a previous version if you run into problems. Many times, we provide this functionality through version control. This allows us to keep detailed documentation on things like changes to router configurations, patches inside of the Windows operating system, changes to registries when you're updating an application, and anything else where you can track what happens between point A and point B. You may find that the applications or operating systems that you're using already have some type of version control built in. And there might be a very easy way within that application or operating system to click a button, make a change, and suddenly you're running a different version. If your application or operating system doesn't integrate any type of version control, you might want to install a third-party version control management system so that you can manage all of your systems and know exactly when changes are made and what those changes are doing.